Welcome to Secrets True Crime, The Disappearance of Jessica Hamby. I am your host, Amber Sitton. What is done in darkness will eventually come to light. That is the purpose of this podcast, to shine light on the disappearance of Jessica Hamby. Listener discretion is advised. The subject matter may involve violence, sexual content, murder, and adult themes. This episode does contain foul language. It's not suitable for younger listeners. This is episode five of season three of a serialized podcast, and the episodes are designed to be listened to in order. Jessica Leanne Hamby has been missing since January 3rd, 2018. At the time of her disappearance, the 24-year-old mother of three was a beautiful brunette with big hazel eyes. She had a head full of long, thick hair, was five foot two inches tall, and weighed approximately 125 pounds. In the four and a half years since Jessica was last reported to be seen, the stories regarding her disappearance and fate have been plentiful and the facts scarce. In season three of Secrets True Crime, The Disappearance of Jessica Hamby, we are starting from the beginning. And by the beginning, we are beginning with Jessica's life six months prior to her disappearance. We are going to focus on the details and try to discern fact from fiction. As we began to interview people about Jessica's disappearance, It didn't take long for us to notice a common theme. Jeremy Abbott. Um, Jeremy Abbott. Jeremy Abbott. Jeremy Abbott. Jeremy Abbott. Jeremy Keith Abbott was reported missing June 19th, 2017 in Haleyville, Alabama. 32 days later, He was found hanging from a tree behind a home on Benefield Farm Road. 20-year-old Jeremy had an infant son. He was a much-loved son, brother, nephew, cousin, and friend. There were very few people connected to Jessica that didn't mention Jeremy's death to us, and all indicated that Jessica was troubled, scared, and that Jeremy's death changed everything for her. As we revealed at the end of the last episode, Jessica knew something about Jeremy's death. But what exactly did she know, and how did she obtain this knowledge? Here's what Jessica's dad, Keith, told us. I just know Jesse cared about the kid. And when that happened, everything changed. She became more guarded paranoid and even anxious at times. And I only personally saw Jeremy a few times. I didn't know him personally, but for her to care about him so much, there had to be a lot of good in him. That's just how she rolled. For her to care that much for somebody, the rule was, must have a good heart and a good soul because that's what she had. And I want to say this too about Jessica. We talked about her telling law enforcement where Jeremy Jeremy's body was and she knew she had a very tough decision ahead of her and when we were talking about it I said I just mentioned to her I said I want you to remember this though you know Jeremy I know you cared for Jeremy but Jeremy has a mama he has a family that's worried to death about him and I said on the flip side of that you know, you could be putting yourself in harm's way if you do tell that story. I said, I can't make that decision for you. I said, if I could, I would tell you to just run. I said, but that's not going to help you now. And, you know, I guess in the back of my mind, I knew how Jesse felt about Jeremy. And I also knew what kind of heart she had. And that's why she made the decision to tell law enforcement where Jeremy was. But she never told you directly how she knew where Jeremy was? No. 
No, she never did. Yeah, I ask her, you know, hey, tell me, Jesse, tell me what happened. Tell me what's going on. And she would just say, I know where he is. And what should I do? And at that point, I knew, I knew she knew more than what she was telling me for sure. Jessica's mom, Lynn, had additional details to share with us. Note that there is a name Lynn says numerous times that we've bleeped out. She's talking about the same person each time the name is obscured. Jessica, she told me that she kept telling me, you know, that she was scared. That they, I'm like, Jesse, why are you scared? She's like, Mommy, I'm a monster. And I said, Jesse, what do you mean you're a monster? And she just kept beating herself up, you know, and she just wouldn't talk to me about it. And finally, you know, when they asked, Jessica, you're going to have to talk to me. And uh, she said, Mommy, she said, well, what if I told you I know what happened to Jeremy and uh, I, I should have been there with him? I said, what do you mean, Jess? And she proceeded to tell me that the day that uh, Jeremy actually uh, disappeared, that her and Jeremy and Josh Hyde and, and I can't remember who else had been down at Josh Hyde camper that that day and had been getting high and I said okay and she said that uh Jeremy his girlfriend at the time was uh Rebecca and they were arguing that day and uh she said it was just real bad that uh Jeremy was just an emotional wreck and so she said you know it was Jesse David at one time but she just said that he'd just been acting off you know, that day, and she just couldn't lay her finger on it. Well, when, uh, you know, I don't know, it rocked on anyway that Jeremy and Rebecca had got into it, and she had said some things to him, and uh, it upset him, and, you know, he was just sitting, they were sitting there in the camper, and, you know, he was just uh, just sitting there thinking about it over and over and over, you know, getting madder and madder, and all of a sudden, he says, uh, hey, let's just go for a walk, you know, uh, clear your head, blah, 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 and uh, I don't know talked them into going for a walk somehow and uh, Jesse said that they wound up walking I don't know where into the woods you know which she trusted Jeremy you know they grew up together he was a little bit younger than her but they they rode the school bus together and went to school you know they were like uh, never boyfriend and girlfriend they're just really close really close friends so of course you know Jessica she's gonna go with them and of course you know she used to date and she, she grew up with as a matter of fact she was friends with uh, his sister so she said they go for this walk. <clears throat> she said it was just, she said the further they got in, you know, she didn't think nothing about it at first, you know, because uh, she'd been down there before. As a matter of fact, me and my uh, passed away husband, my deceased husband, we lived down there at that spot at Benefield Farm Road, Benefield Dairy Farm Road. Uh, we rented a camping spot down there on the lake for about seven months. And so, you know, she just, she wasn't really worried about it. You know, she'd been, you know, whatever. Anyway, she says they get down there. She she didn't go into great detail of who it was. She was very, very, very scared. Um, she didn't want to talk to me. She was trembling. She was shaking. You know, she was, she was just, you could tell she was an emotional wreck for this month that had rocked on. And she had told me that, you know, she she was she felt like she was a monster, that she should have been there, you know. And I'm like, Jessica, what are you talking about? You know, I'm like, I thought she was talking out of her head, you know. And then she's like, Mama Jeremy. And I said, Jeremy who? She said, Mom. I said, you come out Jeremy Abbott? She's like, yeah. And she just started crying just uncontrollably. I mean, just sobbing. She's like, Mommy, I shouldn't have left him. I shouldn't have left him. And I said, what do you mean, Jessica? She said that when they got down there to wherever they went, walked to, whatever, that it was sort of like a sort of an ambush. She said there was people down there. And they snatched Jeremy uh, because supposedly Jeremy and Jessica had hit a lick on someone or somebody had hit a lick on someone and blamed it on them. I'm not real sure how it went. But this person that was hit, and uh, so this guy uh, sends down word that he wants to make an example out of who, who it was that hit him. So the duty went to JK and to some of his other people to, you know, find out who did, who hit this lick and make an example out of them. Well, evidently, um, that's what was had planned on going on. Because, see, I was told that was in on hitting that lick, too. And that had agreed with these other people to get Jessica and Jeremy, 
you know, for them. Well, JK at the time did not realize that his own nephew was one of the people that he was going to have to be making an example out of. And Jessica said when, you know, when they got down there, she said she knew, she knew, she knew what was going to go on. So they grabbed Jeremy and, uh, he, and, you know, she's, she's screaming and just kind of like, you know, just, uh, observing, you know, uh, and he should have been scared too. He should have been running, but he wasn't. She said that Jeremy looked at her, that they had grabbed him and, you know, they were, I guess, hitting him. Be, I don't know exactly what's going on. She was very, um, limited on that. Uh, you could tell that she was traumatized and she said that Jeremy looked at her and said, run, Jessica, run. And she said, no. And he, she said, he said, I said, fucking run. She said, mama, that, she said that, she said when he screamed at me that second time, she said, I just ran. She said, me and we just ran. Now, and Jessica had thorns in her feet, you know, I guess, you know, it was summertime, maybe she had flip-flops on or something, I don't know. But she literally ran out of her shoes and she had thorns a half inch into her foot. I mean, you know, this, I mean, her legs were all scratched up, you know, I mean, you could tell she was, she was running from something. And, you know, she just kept beating herself up, kept beating herself up. And she's like, uh, I think this was maybe, uh, well, you know, she, I was like, Jessica, do you know what happened? Do you know where Jeremy is? You know, and she's like, Molly, I'm telling you what I know. She said, but, you know, she said she kept having this dream. It was a nightmare, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, of course, by now, uh, Jeremy's missing persons has been filed. You know, I know that my daughter was with, you know, down in the same spot that day that Jeremy Abbott was. They were all getting high together. So, you know, I, I realized that he's missing, you know, and I realized what Jessica's been talking about. You know, I threw her down one day and I said, Jessica, I said, honey, I said, I don't know what happened. And I, I said, evidently, you're too scared to tell me because she wouldn't tell me anything about it. She just kept saying, Mommy, I didn't do it. Mommy, I didn't do it. Mommy, I didn't do it. Talking about hitting the lick. I said, Jessica, I don't care about the lick. I said, I need to know about Jeremy. I said, you're a mommy. I said, and I'm a mom. And it killed me because I told her to do this. It just, I told her, I said, you need to tell where that boy is. And give that mom some closure. She said that she didn't want to go to the police. And she would just, she would just tap topping, you know. You never, I never knew where she was. From one minute to the next, she was just constantly on the move, you know. She never stayed nowhere long, not at all. Then, um, you know, she complained she was scared, she was scared, you know. And I knew that she had a, a bond that she had not been paying on. And, you know, I couldn't keep track of her. So, me and my niece, Kristen, so um, I got in touch with Jeff the uh, bail bondsman and he confirmed yes you know that he was looking for her and yes she was going to go to jail and no she wasn't going to be able to get out blah 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 and so I'm playing this in my mind you know and me and Kristen and her husband um, talked Jessica into letting Kristen pick her up and uh, took her up there to Jeff and turned her over to Jeff so he would take her to jail because I thought, you know, if anywhere, maybe she'd be safe in there. You know, she wouldn't have to run. She wouldn't have to be, keep doing this. You know, I really didn't know exactly what all she had gotten into. And, you know, she just kept saying, I'm scared, I'm scared, I'm scared. It seems that Jessica might have been scared for good reason, too. Lynn told us that when Kristen picked Jessica up, Jessica was having a hard time walking, and they learned of a very disturbing incident. Jessica had marks on her wrist and ankles from being bound, and the bottoms of her feet had been intentionally burned. Kristen said she saw her feet, and they were terrible. And she said that, uh, and got it as a warning for her to keep her mouth shut, because evidently was one of the ones that was down there with uh, Jeremy Abbott that day. Lynn named two people that burned Jessica's feet, a man and a woman. Lynn told us that a friend of hers came to her after Jessica was missing. Her friend told her the woman Jessica named as the one who burned her feet showed her photos of the injuries to Jessica's feet. 
The friend said the photos of the burns were so horrific that she got sick and threw up. Lynn confronted the woman, and she denied it all. She denied burning Jessica's feet, and she also denied having photos of it. Lynn told us she knows her friend was not lying to her, and she described her friend as being quite distressed and upset over what she'd seen. Lynn said once she knew for sure that Jessica was in the Winston County Jail and her bond was in fact revoked so that she couldn't get out, she and a friend of hers went to a Haleyville police officer's home. She said she told him everything she knew. I said, you're looking for someone, you look for a boy, you look for Jeremy Abbott. And I told him what little bit I knew. And I told him that Jessica said that uh, she would tell. I don't know how she knew. I, I never knew the details of that. Lynn told me she was scared, but she trusted this officer and he reassured her. I'll go down there and talk to her. You know, he said, I promise you that we'll make sure she's, you know, protected. She's not going to get in harm's way. We won't question her at the sheriff's office. And, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, I was upset. Promised me, you know, he'd he'd keep her protected. If they had to, they'd put her in a, you know, protective custody, whatever. And I believed him. And uh, so he didn't make it down there that that, uh, evening. He made it down there the next afternoon to talk to Jessica. And he was supposed to pull her out of Winston County and not talk to her in front of anyone. But he did. He pulled her right out and he talked to her and I guess he told she told him whatever. And they let her sign a revoked bond and walk out the door uh the next morning. Because the next morning at nine fifteen AM they found Jeremy Abbott after they had talked to Jessica. And after they found him that's when they come back and they let her sign her own bond and went and picked her up from Winston County because I had been blowing her cell phone up because I knew that she was getting out because, you know, I'd been asking them, please, you know, please don't let her out uh, because I'd heard, you know, they found Jeremy that morning and, uh, oh, there's nothing they could do, you know, and so she signed it on signature bond and walked out. I knew that was bad. The man Lynn said picked Jessica up from the Winston County Jail was the same man that Jessica told Lynn ran with her when Jeremy was attacked. I know that some might not understand exactly what Lynn meant when she said she knew it was bad that Jessica was suddenly able to get out of jail by signing her own bond. If someone associated with illegal drugs has been arrested and suddenly gets out of jail when they were being held with no bond, it is most often assumed that they snitch to law enforcement in exchange for their release. And as you'll often hear in those circles, snitches wind up in ditches. Lynn knew that Jessica would be labeled as a snitch, and she knew that was dangerous. However, the truth is that Jessica did not snitch We have confirmed with sources and law enforcement that Jessica did direct law enforcement to the area where Jeremy was found, but they also stated that Jessica did not provide any information about his death other than the location where they found him. Jessica simply told them that that was where she'd last seen Jeremy walking. We spoke to Jeremy's mom, Kimberly, and you're about to hear from her too. Kimberly was a single mom, and she raised Jeremy on her own. She told us that she and Jeremy were particularly close. Also, note that when Lynn mentioned a man named J.K. Abbott, she was referring to one of Kim's brothers. One of the first things we asked Kim to tell us was what Jeremy was like. He was a good person. Like, I mean, he was always, I mean, as a as a child, I mean, he was always, like, good. He didn't ever bother anybody, didn't ever do anything. He'd do anything for anybody. If you ever needed help or if you ever needed anything, you know, everybody knew they could go to Jeremy because he was, he was always there. As he got a little bit older, you know, he started hanging out with uh, my nephews. And, you know, I guess they got into using drugs. And but, I mean, he was still, he was still, even after he used drugs, he was still good. 
he had a lot of a lot of things he wanted to do. He just couldn't couldn't figure out how to how to do them. I guess because of the whole thing with him being on drugs, and so that kind of clouded his his judgment. Like he wanted to go into the Air Force. He was really really excited, but then he decided to drop out of school. Then so he got his GED. One of the cousins that Kimberly is referencing is a man named Jesse Abbott. Jesse is the son of one of Kim's brothers, Carrie Abbott. Although Jesse was approximately eight years older than Jeremy, the two men were close. Jesse and Jeremy spent a lot of time together and shared many of the same friends, including Jessica. The last time Kimberly ever saw or spoke to her son was when he came to her house on June 16th, 2017. We asked her what prompted her to file the missing persons report on June 19th. Um, because I had gotten a message from Josh Hyde. Um, you know, I posted on, on Facebook, you know, we were looking for Jeremy. And then I had gotten a message from Josh Hyde telling me that um, I might as well just go ahead and file the missing persons report because Jeremy wouldn't be coming home. What tipped you off? I mean, what made you start looking for for Jeremy, is it just because he hadn't been by your house? Actually, you know, we were already like, you know, because he would go, you know, a day or two without talking to anybody. But like I said, it was more because of the situation that had happened the last day that I seen him because um, him and his baby's mama, Rebecca, had gotten into it at my house. So you know, then he said, well, I'm going back to Haleville. He said, I love you and I'll see you later. That was the last time I heard from him. I told him to make sure once he got back to Haleville and he got internet to make sure that he contacted me, but he never did. Did he have a phone? He did, but it didn't have minutes. It was like he only used it when it had, uh, when he had Wi-Fi. When you filed the missing persons report, what police department did you go to to file it? In Haleyville. Moving forward, you will hear Kimberly mention a man named Tim Stein. At that time, Tim was the investigator with the Haleyville Police Department. Tell me again about the message from Josh Hyde. Was it a message or did he comment on a post you made? No, no, it was a message. Like he sent me a message and I showed that message when I filed the police report. I showed that message to, uh, like I said, I'm pretty sure it was Tim Stein because he's the only one that I really, as far as Jeremy being missing, he was the only one that I really had contact with. Just yeah, I showed him the message. Yes. And what did the message say again? It said, um, you might as well go ahead and file the uh, missing persons report because Jeremy's not coming home. Did you try to ask him? Why he said that? What made him think that? I, I did, but he didn't respond back. Like, because Tim, Tim, the when I went into the police station, that's what he said. He said, well, did you send anything back? And I said, no. And he said, well, why would he say that? And I said, I have no idea. So while I was there, I sent a message back to Josh Hyde, but he didn't, he didn't respond anything back. Even after Kimberly filed the missing persons report, there were a number of people who were contacting her to say they'd seen Jeremy. All of these people were in the same circle of friends and acquaintances that Jeremy hung out with. As Kimberly kept searching for her missing son, these reported sightings of Jeremy were coming from every direction, and there were some suspicious incidents. Once I got the message from Josh Hyde, that he wasn't coming back, I knew that something had happened. Like, I didn't know what happened, but, I mean, I knew that that something. So, I mean, we immediately, us, we just started looking. Like, me, my family, I had a couple of my, my friends, and, you know, we were, like, every single day, we would go out and look in the places that people would say, oh, well, you know, this is where they go to use drugs. One being Quarter Creek, you know, we, we went out there and that's, that's how I really learned of the involvement, what involvement my nephew had or 
started suspecting that he was involved in some kind of way. How is that? Because, okay, so we were supposed to go out one day looking for Jeremy, as, as we did every day, you know, but Jesse had spoken with my daughter and he was supposed to go with them. My daughter, Danielle, and my daughter, Yasmin, and Jesse. Jesse was supposed to take them to places where, you know, they would go buy drugs from or they would go to, you know, their friend's house and use drugs. So he was supposed to go with them. Well, me and my friend and my other friend, I was using their vehicle because at the time I didn't have a vehicle. And we were going to go just just looking around, you know. Well, we all met up at the apartments in Mineral Springs Apartments. And as I was pulling out from there, Yasmin decided to go with me instead of my other daughter. And my son, my other son went with with Danielle. Well, as I was pulling out, like I stopped at the stop sign and then all of a sudden somebody jumps on the side of the I was driving a a Escalade and they jumped on the side of it. And it was Jesse. And he was like, what are y'all doing? What are y'all doing? He came from the railroad tracks. What are y'all doing? What are y'all? And I said, we're about to go out to Quarter Creek. We're going to go look, you know, because somebody had told me that people go out there and use drugs in those little woods out there. And and I said, I'm going to go because they said Jeremy had been out there a lot. He was like, oh, I want to go. I want to go. So I said, okay. I mean, at that point in time, I didn't think anything about it. Like I, I had no suspicion that Jesse had anything to do with it. I mean, he was my nephew, Jeremy's cousin, you know, so but we went out there and we got to Quarter Creek. I parked at the boat dock and I said, so you've been out here before. And he said, yeah, this is where we come to use drugs. You know, we'll come out here and sometimes we sleep out here. He said, there's tents in there. There's tents and there's we have all kind of stuff in there. And I said, so you can get through there. Yeah. And I said, well, look, I'm going to I'm going to drop you off right here and I'm going to go around and I'm going to pull on the other side and you can walk through. And I said, just see if you see anything or or anything's not normal, whatever. And so he said, okay. Well, so me and my daughter go around and we pull around on the other side. We were there for a good 30 minutes. And, you know, he had already told us it took about three minutes to get through there. So we're sitting there like 30 minutes. And I'm like, where is he at? Like, what is he doing? Like, did he find something? So we were already almost ready to get out of the vehicle. And I look up in the mirror and here he comes walking down where you pull in from the road into Quarter Creek, you know, into the swimming area. And like he's sweating, just profusely sweating. And I said, I said, what are you doing? Oh, I couldn't get through there. I couldn't get through there. It's all grown up. And so I started looking at him. I was like, Jesse, we've been sitting here for like 30 minutes. Well, I know I was just trying to find a way through there. So. I said, okay, all, all right. So, you know, at that point in time, I just looked at my daughter. I said, well, let's just go. I said, let's just take him back, drop him off. So we took him back over to Mineral Springs apartment. And I told him, I said, Jesse, I'm just going to go home. I didn't go home. I went and I got uh, my, my friend and I told her, I said, look, we're going to go to Quarter Creek and I'm going to see if we can walk through that, that thing because there's some reason why it took him 30 minutes to decide he was going to come back and he didn't even go through the thing. He said it was growed up. So me and my friend, his name was Christopher. And so we walked straight through there. Took us about four and a half minutes to get from one side to the other. And we walked straight. So at that point in time, I knew something wasn't wasn't right. So when I, I said, you know what? So I took Chris and I dropped him off. And I went back to the apartments and I said, has anybody seen Jesse? No, as soon as you dropped him off, he called somebody and and he's gone. Like nobody's seen him. And so right then at that moment, I knew something wasn't right. Kimberly described another disturbing event to us involving a man named Juan Ortega. One day while out searching for Jeremy, she pulled up to the Mineral Springs apartments. When she pulled up, she saw Juan standing outside the apartments doing something on a phone. She knew Juan, and at the time, she had no suspicions that he might have information about Jeremy's disappearance. Kimberly walked up to him and immediately noticed 
that the phone he had was her son's phone. When questioned, he quickly admitted it was Jeremy's phone, and he owned up to trying to guess the password so that he could gain access to the phone. Kimberly demanded that he give her Jeremy's phone. Juan told her that he couldn't give it to her. He repeatedly told her, I can't. You're going to get me killed. You're going to get me killed. As the discussion between them took place, Kimberly's brother, Carrie, walked up and realized what was happening. Carrie stepped in and gave Juan two choices. He told him that he could either give Kimberly the phone or that he was going to take it from him. He told Juan that if he had to take it from him, it wasn't going to end well. Kimberly told us that Juan immediately began to cry and wail, and she described him crying like you'd see a woman cry and not like you would imagine from a man. He gave Kim the phone and quickly left. Kim later learned that within days of this event, Juan abruptly packed up his belongings and moved to Texas. One of the many reported sightings of Jeremy that Kim spoke of actually came from his cousin Jesse and a female friend of his. There was people that, you know, hung around with both of them saying that they'd seen him. Um, One was... She had actually told the police that she had seen Jeremy walking down the road. Her and Jesse stopped the car. Jeremy asked to borrow the phone so he could call me. And she said that Jesse uh, told him, well, you you need to call your mom because she's really worried about you. And said that all of a sudden he just threw the phone down and took off running. Like, didn't call anybody. He just took off running for no apparent reason, which the police found that out to be a lie because they questioned her when she wasn't with Jesse. And she said Jesse threatened her that she better tell them that. If not, he was going to hurt her. While we were looking for him, we had went to house, which is was the girlfriend at the time of, well, she was between boyfriends, Juan Ortega and Daniel Luna. So she was the girlfriend of both of them at the time. We had went over there, but she said Jeremy had been over there with Jesse two or three times. This was probably two weeks in to him being missing. And she said that he had been over there two or three times with Jesse to talk to Juan and Daniel, but she wasn't getting involved that we needed to leave her house. So you know, naturally, we we left. Then on July the 4th, just practically swore to me that she was going in Rebecca's house and Jeremy was going out of the apartment that Rebecca's mom lived in. Now, this was July the 4th. And I said, so, I mean, she's knew Jeremy since he was a child. And I said, so you're sure it was Jeremy? Yes. Well, come to find out, Jesse had put her up to doing that also. Kim mentioned a man named Daniel Luna. We have no confirmation of this, but many say that Daniel was later deported. Whatever the reason, Daniel ended up in Mexico. Someone who was around Alicia Motes got her phone and started looking through it. They allegedly found a photo on that phone that showed a dead man who looked an awful lot like Daniel Luna. Using their own phone, they took a photo of the photo on what was said to be Alicia's phone and provided it to some people connected to Jessica's case. We were also provided the photo, and we noticed it had some white text in Spanish written across it. I typed that text into the Facebook search bar and found a Tijuana, Mexico news site that posts many graphic and gory photos of the violence and the bodies of those who are victims to that violence in Tijuana. I scrolled until I found the photo we'd been given. I don't speak Spanish, so I pasted the text from the post into a Spanish translation website. 
According to that information, the unidentified man was shot twice in the stomach on the night of November 1st, 2020. By the time the police arrived, he was already deceased. We have been able to confirm that this man was the man commonly referred to as Daniel Luna. As Kimberly continued to search for her son, the false reports just kept coming. Josie Alvarez said she's seen him by behind Solid Rock Church, which is by the apartments where Rebecca's mom lived. So my niece, since she lived right there in those apartments, she decided she was going to go over there. So she, she started that way, and she said she's seen somebody take off running. Well, she continued on over there, and Josie was trying to follow the person in the car. Well, they ran up behind the Solid Rock Church and over through back behind Gores and all that. So we were assuming that maybe at that point in time, until I got in contact with my niece, we were assuming that maybe Jeremy had went back around. Maybe it was Jeremy. So he went back around and went into the apartments again. Well, when my niece got over there, there was uh, some stuff that the person had left there. And... When she seen the stuff, she just immediately called me and she said, Kim, it's not Jeremy. She said, it's Jesse. And he's trying to act like Jeremy because she had been to her house like the week before, the week prior, Jesse had. And gotten a char- a phone charger and some other things. Well, that's what was left there. And so Jeremy had already been missing at that time. This was like the beginning of July. Jeremy had already been missing, you know, at least almost two weeks. And she said he would not have had access to this stuff that was left there. So then, you know, I started like questioning people, you know, are you sure you're seeing Jeremy? Because everybody would say like I would get messages. Oh, well, I seen Jeremy walking here and I seen, you know, Jeremy running right through here and. So during that time, that's when the whole, I had said something about that. And she said, Kim, I know Jeremy's still alive because I seen him coming out of Rebecca's. But by that time, I already knew that people were just saying that they seen him and that it was Jesse. Jesse was pretending to be Jeremy. Did they look alike? And if so, kind of describe that. They did. And I mean, at that point in time, like if you seen them from from a distance, you would think now if you got close up to them, they they don't look anything alike. Kim spoke to Haleyville PD investigator Tim Stein throughout the month Jeremy was missing. Tim Stein had told me that he was doing everything that he could and he had been to Josh Hyde's house by that point twice because you know that was the last place anybody had seen him and he had talked to Josh Hyde Josh Hyde had told him that Jeremy and Rebecca had been arguing Jeremy had left his house and went walked out into the woods behind his his little I guess it's a camper like trailer thing early on the morning of July 21st 2017 Kimberly received a call I heard early in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, 6.30, somebody called me and said they found Jeremy. I called between 6.30 and 9, I called the police station five times, and they told me they hadn't found nobody. They didn't know what I was talking about, that the police were there. They were all there at the station. But all the while, they were out there where Jeremy was. Do I kind of understand that? Kind of. They might have had to lie because they didn't want nobody out there. But then it also makes me think, why did they not? Anybody Kimberly knew they were lying to her, and she couldn't sit at home any longer. I get my stuff, get my clothes. Well, I didn't have a phone at that point in time. I had to, my friend came from Haleville to pick me up to take me. I didn't have my phone. I broke my phone because I slammed my phone. Like, I threw my phone. Like, I threw it, and it just it shattered. So, I didn't have a phone, so she brought my phone. I took my SIM card out, put it in there. We were headed to Haleville, and this is the phone call I got. My phone started ringing, and I picked it up, and I said, hello, where do you want your son's body taken to? And I said, what the fuck? Like, and I was cussing. 
like I was cussing. I was mad. Mad wasn't even the words. Like I hated him at one point in time. Like I, I had hate because I said, "Who, who? He's in law enforcement, and he's going to call somebody and, and and act like that. Who does that?" You know what I'm saying? Who does that? So then, you know, I just immediately went to, I told him where to take him, and I, that's where I went. Like, yeah. So I, I went to the funeral home, blah, blah, blah. All that stuff happened. And then, you know, but I just think that because it's not their child or because, you know, he was on drugs or because Jessica, you know, was in, you know, with the wrong crowd, like, they, they are being pushed to the side, and that should not happen. That should not have happened. We did. For a while, like, I hated everybody. I'm just saying, like, I, I didn't even really want to go out of my house. I didn't want to talk to nobody. I didn't want to, I didn't want to do anything. But then I say, hey, Kim, you're going to have to, you're going to have to get up. You're going to have to do something. You're going to have to just not say move on, but you're going to have to figure out where your, your place is and where you can continue, like your peace is so you can go on. Because, I mean, like I said, I do have my grandchild, so I had to go to work. I had to to get back on my feet right then, but it was hard. And, like, people, well, Kim, the past is the past. You have to move on. No, there, there's not no moving, losing a child. There, there's not no moving on from that. I think we can all agree that the call she received was an insensitive and cruel way for a mother to be told that her son was dead. However, the events that followed Jeremy's body being found would continue to get worse for Kimberly. I said, I'm about to go back. I said, I'm just going to tell you that I'm not going to let this go. I said, because I know my son did not commit suicide. And he said, ma'am, the best thing for you to do is just to let this go because nobody else is going to do anything about it because it was ruled a suicide. So I just got up and I just walked out. There's much more information to come about the death of Jeremy Abbott and the potential connections between Jeremy's death and the disappearance of Jessica Hamby. Join us next time as we continue to investigate and push for justice for Jessica and now Jeremy Abbott too. If you have any information that could help solve the disappearance of Jessica Hamby or the death of Jeremy Abbott, please email me at secretstruecrime at gmail.com or call our confidential tip line at 205-282-0740. Michael and I will ensure that all information gets to the right place right away. If you are still left wanting even more content, please check us out on Patreon. We have it filled with great information about Susan and Evan, Eric and Gypsy, and we will be adding additional content about Jessica. This podcast is an independent podcast. That means that everything that goes into making this podcast is done and funded by me. All of the investigative tools and resources are provided by Echo 7 Foxtrot. The tragedies we highlight and investigate have had a tremendous impact on the victims, loved ones, and friends. We don't burden them with the additional expenses to cover their cases. We donate our time and talents because we want to help and hope to find the answers they need that are so long overdue. For as little as $5 per month, you can receive exclusive access to members-only photos, videos, early access to episodes, and much, much more. By becoming a patron, you too are helping us to help these families. Patreon.com slash Secrets Crime. I'll also post the link on our Facebook page. If you are enjoying this podcast... Be sure to follow or subscribe in your podcast player of choice and by giving us a five-star rating and review. We are active on social media and will often share photos of Jessica. Follow Secrets True Crime on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Secrets Crime. This episode was co-written by me and Michael Fleming. 
The audio production for this podcast is by Kane Power at precisionpodcasting.com. From the late 1960s to the early 1990s, the United States saw an unprecedented surge in serial killing, rooted not just in the dynamic changes of the post-war period, but in the development of the human psyche going back many millennia to our ancient past. Wonder why serial killers exist, why they emerge, and why they exploded in the post-war United States? Check out The Golden Age of Murder, a panoramic look at serial killing focusing on the United States in the post-war period with your hosts, Toby and Simeon.